Good evening, popular astronomers. Oh, my voice is cracking with emotion. That is because it is Pop Astro Live and I feel like I've been away for a year, even though it was only a week. So how are you? We are going to start the show in a moment. I will just play the countdown music. In the meanwhile, start sharing the feed. It helps with our algorithms massively if you share this feed within the first couple of minutes. So hit the share button multiple times. You can share it on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, go and share it with your family um, like a nice tin of biscuits. Tell everybody that Pop Astro Live is about to commence. And if you are watching this as a rerun, it still helps massively if you share the feed. So much to catch up on popular astronomers. It feels like I've been away for uh, absolutely ages and I haven't really. I'll tell you one thing that has changed. The sun has moved position. It is coming in through that window. Um, I'm just going to push it. Oh, I've got a disco ball. It only gets illuminated about three nights of the year. I've shoved the window right open and hopefully no horse flies will come in. We had a horse fly inside the other day. How scary is it getting a horse fly in your domestic environment? It is petrifying and makes you do very rapid karate moves. Thank you, David. Hi, great. Okay, I'll come to that one in a minute. Hi, Vicky. I hope you enjoyed your break. Yes, I had my mother here. It was fantastic. Um, we live on a holiday park and people are coming back. So mum was here and we've had a string of other guests. I've done so much hoovering. Wow, housework is overrated. Hi, Bob. Uh, good evening, Vicky and everyone. Hope you all had a nice week. Yes, Sonia's presentation tonight is on extreme weather, which if these heat waves continue, I think we're going to be getting some fairly extreme weather. Hello, David Graham, regular contributor to the show. It's lovely. Oh, Bob, I missed you too. The man with the stars for his face. I missed you too. So um, I'm just going to twiddle with something here. Something has changed here. Ah, there we go. I knew my comments didn't look right. They were coming up too high. I've changed the um, theme now from blocky to bubbly. See, that's better now. My Facebook comments aren't barring out my very bright pink lipstick. Jed Mack, the delightful Jed Mack. Thank you for all of your lovely kind comments. Um, hi, Vicky. Evening from the Wirral. Hope I enjoyed the visit from the mother. Yes, it was gorgeous. Thank you. More guests booked in this week. Okay, so, uh, right, got to remember how to do all this. Plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug. Plug the mug and all of the other Pop Astro merchandise, which is available in the Pop Astro shop. This is the basic gear model of the um, mug, but you can get ones with Sturry Sturry Night. You know the stuff. We've got uh, jewellery. We've got all sorts of other Astro stuff. I'm two-timing the Pop Astro necklaces with my star necklace. I bought it for my sister's birthday. She said it was a bit tight on her. And I got to keep it instead. So, you know that thing about always buying people a birthday or Christmas present that you want yourself? Look, I got that. That is not available in the Pop Astro shop. That is my model zone jewellery. So, tell us uh, what you have seen in the sky this past couple of weeks. Um, I know um, there have been some, let's have a look. Uh, perhaps you saw Mercury uh, and, oh, hang on, that's that's an old one that is, ignore that. Just tell me what you've had in the sky, seen in the sky this week. I've seen some amazing NLC pictures. I'm gonna show you these, these will change your life. Look, these, it's a USB neck fan. Now I'm not gonna wear it around my neck because I'll look even more bonkers than I usually do, but, these things, portable cooling on hot days and nights. I'm just going to use it as a little desk fan. Where can I put it? There's not really much room on here. That's why it goes around your neck, Vicky. I'll turn it over to number two. I'll have it long distance. Also, it's got groovy lights. Yeah. Okay. So, what have we... <laughs> you see, Naga Manchetti and Chris Lintot have people doing this for them, but... I am doing it all on my own and such things as personal cooling become very paramount when you're not in a TV studio. So this week we have got an amazing eclectic mix of guests. 
This week, it's physicist and circus performer, Dr. Adam Dippert, or Dippert, I'm assuming. I forgot to ask him how to say his name. So um, we'll go die or dip on his world premiere of the first circus act designed for zero gravity. Then it's on to our favourite binocular astronomer, Steve Tonkin, on getting the light right at night. Eleni is here with the space news. Sonia has the observing forecast and the presentation for beginners. Right, where's Cosmo? Actually, where is Cosmo? He was on the floor before and I he has actually disappeared. Well, that's no problem. Oh, here he is. Hang on, he's behind the... Ah, oh, the what a reach. What a reach. Cosmo, get out. Cosmo has been up to something a little bit different this week. He's I still got this bit of tinsel around his neck from Sonia's house. Let's try and free him. It's like something off Watership Down. Free him. <laughs> uh... Cosmo has got something a little bit different for you tonight. He's preparing for his big stunt. He's also been jetting off to amazing places in the solar system, but he's preparing for his big stunt, which we will come to later. So guess what, popular astronomers? I have had an internet upgrade. If you have followed the tribulations of me for the past year, you will know that every other show has had pixelated internet. It's turned my hair grey and it's been a real tribulation for all of the wonderful, loyal viewers. Now, we spoke to the people who upgraded our um, communal Wi-Fi here and um, they have very kindly sent out this massive, enormous black box thing that means I can plug directly into the hub. Uh, it looks like something you would find in an IT hub. It is huge, but it's giving me between 40 and 60 megs. Ah, so hopefully my internet is going to be stable forever and ever. Amen. And I'm not going to keep seeing that awful little light flashing up on my laptop that says it's weak internet. So pray for me, everybody. Pray for me. I keep freezing. What? It says it's 50 megs. Do I really keep on freezing, Sonia? Do, oh. Okay, let's see what you're all saying. I have frozen. Oh, Sonia. They've tried everything now. We can't do any more. This is it. This is me and my natural... Am I still frozen, Sonia? Am I really? This is really distressing. It's looking good where I'm not freezing. Maybe it's maybe it's Sonia's new internet. Sonia, it's your internet. Blame your internet. Stop taking me to the edge of biting all my nails off like this. Uh, hi, Jim. I was re repairing and painting the stairway to heaven last week. Okay, that's cryptic. Um, evening, Michael. Lovely and clear here last night, although a lot of dew on everything. Mind your equipment. A further display of noctilucent clouds last night. Great. Hi, all. Hi, Gwyneth. Doesn't Vicky need to... Do a plug the mug techie song. Yeah, I will. I will. Who's got rain? When was it raining? We've got a heat wave here. Anyway, there we go. Right. It's the best I've seen. Sonia, it better be your internet and not my internet. <laughs> I can't deal with the heartache anymore. Yes, it's Sonia. She's freezing. She's also smouldering hot. Okay. Look at, hi, John, how are you? Looking good in um, the High League Community Observatory. I'm going to have to take my blouse off in a minute and go just for the T-shirt underneath. Okay, we're going to blame the freezing internet on Sonia. So that is great stuff. Okay, so if you go over to the Pop Astro page, Robin has made a new video of the Midsummer Stars. It's a brilliant guide. Whether you are a novice astronomer or very experienced, Robin's brilliant in-depth video is going to show you the layout of stars, of galaxies, constellations that you might have forgotten or just need a little refresher lesson on. Or if you are brand new to the world of astronomy, welcome. The SPA is for absolutely everybody, no matter what your level. Maybe this is your first time watching the show tonight. If you go over to the Pop Astro page, you will find a wealth of resources to accelerate and embellish your astronomy. Okay. Ah, uh, oh, you know what happened this time last year? The Milky Way was so bright on two moonless nights that it was casting a shadow like a full moon. And I walked home with this silver light enveloping me and it was bright enough to cast shadows and I cried. I cried both nights. So that's Anglesey for you. Enough to reduce a grown woman to tears by the bright light of the Milky Way. But I've never seen it like that ever since. 
Okay, now we're going to go over on to our first guest. He is or was a circus performer. Um, he ran away to join the circus. He really, really did. So we're going over to Adam in uh, the United States. Adam, are you ready? Come in in three, two, one. Here he is. Hi. All right. Hello. How are you? You're Hi. sounding pretty good. Thank you. Do I keep freezing to you or am I all right? Nope, not for me. And I'm in the middle of uh, the hurt or tropical storm uh, lease uh, coming north right now. So, uh, so anyways, yeah, we got right. Oh, are you? Is everybody okay there? We're doing okay right now. It's just been a whole day of rain, but no, uh, no damage yet. Oh, good. Well, I hope you all stay safe. Now, Adam, um, how do we say your surname? Sorry, Diapert. Diapert. Okay. Hi, Adam. Well, you're probably my most random guest so far. Give us a little backstory to your incredible, colourful life. Um, let's see. I ran away to join the circus when I was 19 and spent four years just traveling around the United States and Canada doing that. I became a circuit or a juggler and object manipulator. And then I started my bachelor's degree at Ohio State when I was 23 and uh, ended up with a PhD in experimental nuclear physics. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a hell of a, you call it a resume. In England and the United Kingdom, we call it a CV, a curriculum vitae. So there's some English Latin for you. Always good to learn something new. <laughs> very, very good, yes. You can put on your resume that you know Latin for curriculum vitae. I will. <laughs> it's quite a good appendix to put on any CV. So, yes. Okay. So, um, wow. Tell us a little bit more about your life in the circus. Is it as glamorous and amazing as what everybody thinks it's going to be and as freeing? Yeah, it is really wonderful to go out in front of a bunch of people and do a really cool physical activity and then, you know, have like a couple hundred, uh, you know, eight-year-olds telling you you're awesome. Ah, that's <laughs> but, so uh, good. Yeah, it's it's uh it's fun to perform for adults too, but uh, I really jive on the the multi generational and and kid entertainment. Um, okay, it, it's just uh you know they really know how to express their enthusiasm and and when you go up and are doing something that's very difficult that you've practiced uh, I've I've been doing it for twenty years now and I've you know really worked on some of my skills hard. It's um yeah it's really nice to have the audience uh, feed that back to you a little bit you know because. Uh, I can put out as much energy in five minutes as, uh, you know, most people would put out in two or three hours if I'm, I'm <laughs> or a lifetime. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's a lot of hard work. Um, and I, you know, I really think that if everyone had the opportunity to be a circus performer or a dancer or something like that, they probably would have, you know, it really oh. is appropriately, um, a thing to appreciate and to to aim for if uh if you can make that happen for yourself but also uh yeah oh great okay so adam before we continue we've got a couple of videos to play but now i said yesterday that i'd made or done something for you okay i am so excited to see what you've done you're going to get this at once at the beginning and once at the end. So um, a couple of months ago, I resurrected my ability to make music. I found out I could just do it on my laptop. So I've been making songs for people here, there and everywhere. And oh I've made gosh. you a song. Oh, I've made wow. you a song. Oh, Are you I'm ready so to see it? I'm so ready. Oh, well, it's quite weird and difficult to sing in key with circus music, it turns out. That's my only caveat. So I'm going to play this for you. Let me stop this banner. And basically, this is to help people get an understanding of what you do via the medium of music. And then we'll play it once at the beginning and once at the end to kind of bookend so it kind of sinks in and then people know what it's all about. Are you ready? I don't know if I'm ready, actually. Uh -huh. but I think right. you should Brace still play yourself. it. <laughs> Brace yourself in one of your zero G harnesses. It is coming. Okay, here we go. Dr. Adam studied physics and found his purpose Not an obvious trade, working in a circle But one G is just too much When you're reaching out, trying to touch 
the secrets of zero G movement. He's been practicing for years and making improvements. I aim to demonstrate that scientific and mathematical concepts are more alluring when they are presented in the context of the physical realities from which they arise, says Adam. How will you react when you see this cosmic act? The zero G circus is coming to town! A circus act in microgravity Roll up for a cosmic speciality On his mission to entertain And in trance Dr Adam discovered a whole new dance The Zero G Circus is coming to town The Zero G Circus is coming to town Roll up, roll up, look up, not down Yay! Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Oh wow, you really we got some great rhymes in there. Uh wow, I am I'm stunned. I don't I don't see, you know, how I can follow that up actually. Um, I'm sure you can actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm very glad that, you like that. Oh, that was so fun. Oh my gosh. I was I was bummed you turned my face off during the the thing. I I hope you were able Aww. to see it in the side cam or something. It was I was just so stunned. That that was fabulous. I, uh, I, you have to send me a copy of that so that I can have it in my <laughs> on my drive, so I, I don't ever lose it. Oh, thank you. I'll put it on YouTube for you, and you can refer to it. I will definitely. Thank you. Oh, thank you, so Jim. Fun. It was a lot of work to produce. It took up most of yesterday, and I wasn't. There's so many layers to it: the subtitling, the producing, the rendering, and it's like it is. To be fair, a bit of an all day endeavor, but I think it's worth it to to get these songs out. So yeah, oh, thank you. Oh, that was so fun. I I really yeah. feel honored. <laughs> oh well, I think your videos that you're about to show now have got some serious production value. Should we have a look at one of your um videos? Yeah, um, do the one that shows me sitting in my spacesuit on the left side. Let's go for that. Here I, goes. Here's my idea. <laughs> you know, check, it, check out this idea. How did I get the idea for space juggling? I was studying how humans rotate. There's two ways in any position that you can rotate stably and every other way is not stable. One of the ways that you can spin stably is kind of like a cartwheel where you're spinning around your belly. As I was thinking about that, how the head traces out a circle, I wonder what would happen if you threw a ball down to yourself. You, would, you could probably catch it. That's what would happen. You could probably throw it again. You do that enough times, people including me would start calling it juggling, <laughs> you know? Before I went on my first parabolic flight, I was wondering what would be the most useful thing for me to know. I ended up writing a program with a fully articulated human body that you can move around into any position, and then it calculates what axes you can spin around stably in any position. And I did that to prepare for my flight, and then in the months or year after my first flight was when I came up with the idea. I was talking with Story Musgrave, who's an astronaut who did a lot of uh, movement and dance in space. He is the most capable at speaking about his embodied experience. And he was like, hey, you know, if you take a rope and you put it on a flat surface and you wiggle it back and forth, it moves in kind of a wave. And that's exactly how it would move in space. And so that really got me thinking about this thing that a horizontal plane can cause objects to move in the same way that they would move in space. Then I spent all summer practicing zero-g movement in aerial harnesses and in pools and wind tunnels and float tanks to just try to see which thing gives me a little glimpse of this, which thing gives me a little glimpse of that. And I just thought, okay, I'm just gonna tie myself to the ceiling. I start spinning and I'm holding the balls and I start throwing the balls. They're rolling on the ground and I, I hadn't thought totally about what it would be like to be the guy spinning and watching how the balls move. Even though they travel in a straight line when they're rolling on the ground, or when they're in space, they would travel in a straight line. When you're spinning with it, they're traveling in these curves. It was this whole new challenge to tune in to how that curve was gonna behave and to be able to expect how it was gonna behave. The way to find out is the practice. I'm gonna do this every single week and I'm just gonna find out what happens. At the end of six months, I was confident that there was something very beautiful here <laughs> that, <laughs> that uh, would be interesting for other people to see. Ah, 
So do there you, you have it. That's what do you the... say after that? <laughs> well, there is uh, so much about this that uh, no one video is ever going to, you know, contain the whole story. And uh, what I can say is that's just the start. Wow. So you have got a film coming out. Yeah. So on uh, July 23rd and 24th, uh, I'll be releasing or I'll be holding events during which I'll be showing uh, two films that we've been creating. One of them is uh, a theatrical uh, story about uh, discovering space juggling and about the curiosity of how uh, this movement form could happen. And then the other one is kind of a behind the scenes view of what goes into it because um, every kind of second of footage that you see as you learned yesterday or as you already knew yesterday when you were doing your um, video project, it takes a lot to make any portion of video, right? And um, and the video that we've made, we really put our hearts into and we put all of our artistic uh, expertise into. And so, um, so yeah, July 23rd and 24th, um, we'll be having some events and it would be great to, sh to share those with folks. But before then, um, I'm posting a lot of material online that kind of outlines what this movement style is about um, to describe and get, your, get you mentally prepared for it. Uh, I found that when I shared it with people before I prepped them, they really weren't cognitively ready to deal with what they were seeing. Um, and so I feel like that's one of the, the funnest parts about it is that the more you know about it, the more interesting you, you can find it. Um, you know, that, that I think is one of the major differences between juggling and magic is that, you know, with magic, once you learn the trick, you say, oh yeah, I learned that trick, you know, I get it. And the magic is no longer mysterious, but with juggling, the more you learn about it, the more impressive it becomes. And Ooh, so which is actually the most magical, juggling or magic? Probably oh, juggling then. I'm not the judge of that. <laughs> no, I'm just changing the subject slightly because you've probably worked with magicians. I'm very disappointed to find that um, TV magician magic often involves camera tricks. Oh, geez. Yep. What? I hate to break it to you. Honestly, that's not magic. I could do anything. I could turn myself into a cuddly sloth. Look, snap my fingers and what? That's Wait, not magic. <laughs> that's not magic. If you're manipulating the camera, that's not magic. Anyone could do that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not here to hate on magicians. Really? Magicians, no, I'm sorry. They've, worked, they've worked really hard too. Uh, you know, that's a whole craft. It's important. It's it's culturally relevant. How very um, diplomatic of you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it just came as a shock to me the other day. I was like, really? Yeah, but there, I bet there are magicians on TV that do I hope real so. magic. They just I hope so. are on TV. I hope and so. I, I still can't figure out how they chop a lady in half or a gentleman, a person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe you have to be chopped in half to find out the secret <gasps> to that one. Oh. Oh, that used to I bet you could get yourself dreams. chopped in half. I bet you can make that happen. That's a good mission. That's a good mission. Right. When's your next parabolic flight booked for? So I have one uh, I have one paid for, but I don't have one uh, that's scheduled yet. And uh, that's, that's a good question. I should have a better answer for that. Um, I'm really focused on developing, uh, yeah, sh sharing space struggling and uh, its general its general form um, right now, yeah. So this is Cosmo the Telescope Sloth. Nice. Um, he is actually a little kind of beanie toy, and he said he'd really like to come on a parabolic flight with you. Oh, wow, okay. All right, do you, well, I mean, I I have never taken a sloth on a parabolic flight. Are they, um, are they he's, okay in altered gravitational environments? He's parabolic flight trained. He goes all over the universe, actually. So parabolic flight is just going to be small beans to him, really. Oh, okay. This is really just to entertain me, I assume. <laughs> yeah. He would love to come with you, though. Maybe. Okay. Maybe, Cosmo. Should I we do we, it? Would I you do we it? Could something like that. I bet something like that could happen sometime. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's going to be jumping straight into the nearest letterbox without even putting a mailing address on in his eagerness. <laughs> <laughs> They'll know where to send him. <laughs> they certainly will. Should we have a look at your second video, Adam? Yeah. So I guess before we, we prime it up, this is what I would, I would say about it. Um, the... 
the, the aspect of uh, throwing objects in space is that they would travel in straight lines rather than in parabolas, right? On Earth, they, everything travels in these parabolas. And so that's what we're used to is thinking about the component of juggling uh, that's challenging is that it's always going to go up and it's kind of come back down. And so it was a huge challenge to say, okay, in weightlessness, all you can do is work with straight lines, right? Everything, every time you throw, it's just going to move in a straight line. So how do you get creative with that? And I... Uh, was doing that research on movement. And I thought about this rotation, you know, you can move in a cartwheel and that you can throw down to yourself. And so what you're going to see in these video or in this video on the left side is a frame where I'm throwing the balls down to myself as I spin. And then in the right side, you're going to see video where the camera is spinning with me. And this was kind of one of the really interesting discoveries of the technique was what happens when I rotate the camera with me so that it looks like I'm stationary. So then you're experiencing the act in my reference frame, which is a very, you know, astronomical topic is like what reference frame in which you are looking at things, right? Because obviously there's a lot of galaxies that we can't see because of our reference frame. And so um, in that way, I think it provides this opportunity to show a really clear, physical, concrete way that rep or that reference frame changes what you're capable of seeing. That's so very interesting. Why don't you go ahead and roll the video? Sure. Um, uh, Liam, do you know Liam, oh. by the way? Yeah, yeah. Liam's from our, our space group. Uh, what, what do you think? Um, can you share anything about the Because you're self-funded with this project, aren't you? I have been, yeah. Ah, oh, hopefully we can help you reclaim some of it back. That would be great. Yeah, if people uh, can attend the online events, that is a donation-based $5 plus uh, pay what you can kind of event. Um, and of course, if anybody knows anybody with a spaceship, I uh, am working really hard to be uh, somebody that you would love to see on that spaceship. So um, just putting Ooh. it out there. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Liam was asking... Um, about the amount of time and effort oh, and money uh, mm -hmm. to take you this far. Oh, oh boy. Total this far in the investigation. Um, definitely over $60,000. <gasps> I would guess oh. on the order of 80 to a hundred thousand um, dollars. Mm -hmm. Each parabolic flight uh, now is $6,700. Uh, I got them. So that's what probably 6,000 euro or something right now. Um, or we, but you're in, you're in the UK, so you don't. I'm gonna say it's about euro. five thousand oh pounds, maybe. Yeah, five, okay, let's just say five thousand pounds. Yeah, um, and yeah, it's been eight years, uh, and I've paid for four. No, I paid for five par parabolic flights and three pretty big video productions along the way. And we all know how expensive those video bloggers are. Oh man, they they rack up the bucks real fast. Um. Jim is asking, have you got a website? I've just sent it in the chat. It's the spacejuggler.com. Very simple. And you'll find links to your event right there, will we? I'll yes, put that link will. on as well. I'll pop that yep. link on as well while we watch Thank the film. You. So here's Adam's second film, everybody. Uh, yeah, there so here on the left, you can see the camera's not uh, spinning. And you can tell that because the... Uh, the stars are not spinning. And on the right, the camera is spinning. And so these are exactly the same move, right? I'm doing exactly the same thing in each side. And what's interesting about it is what you see in the rotating frame is actually a subset of uh, Archimedean spirals. Um, whenever you're looking at it in this rotating frame, both the Coriolis and centrifugal forces act on the ball. Um, and I really like this representation of those fictitious forces because so many of our uh, examples of those forces are not so fictitious, right? Hurricanes, uh, our example of Coriolis force, uh, being in a car turning really quick and the forces you experience are an example of centrifugal forces, but you really feel those. In this form, obviously the balls are still traveling in straight lines. Um, and in this video on the left side, you can see that I'm actually throwing the balls parallel to each other. And then on the right side, you can see how the Coriolis and centrifugal forces change what each of those trajectories look like. And I just, I really love this move. When I found it, I, um, yeah, I had to practice it a lot because I wanted it to look good. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, 
quick little look at, at some of the space juggling details. So with the Coriolis effect, when you go into the Southern Hemisphere, do jugglers juggle the other way? Um, <laughs> if, you were, if you were space juggling, you would have to juggle the other way, I think, yep. <laughs> like Australian jugglers, get the, the balls go the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, was really, okay, great. one actually one more layer on that note that I've been really excited to share with people is that um, these are the same trajectories that balls will travel on rotating spaceships as well. Okay, cool. Um, and so if you think about, you know, something like being on, uh, you know, there's this orbital orbital building company that's talking about a kind of bicycle wheel type of spaceship where you live in the ring around the outside, a juggler on that standing with their shoulders in the plane of the ring um, would be juggling these same patterns. And um, yeah, I haven't seen anybody else talking about that. So I'm really excited to be able to share that little insight about what life on a rotating spaceship is gonna be like. You certainly would be my number one choice for in-flight entertainment. Yes, that's what yeah. I'm going for. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. Well, you've, you've, you've already done so much work on it. Uh, Adam, I'm going to play your song once more and then we're going to disappear. Is that all right? Wonderful, thank you. Okay, thank you. No, no camera tricks involved. Dr. Adam studied physics and found his purpose Not an obvious trade, working in a circle But one G is just too much When you're reaching out, trying to touch The secrets of zero-G movement He's been practicing for years and making improvements I aim to demonstrate that scientific and mathematical concepts are more alluring when they are presented in the context of the physical realities from which they arise, says Adam. How will you react when you see this cosmic act? The Zero G Circus is coming to town! A circus act in microgravity Roll up for a cosmic speciality On his mission to entertain and in trance Dr. Adam discovered a whole new dance The Zero G Circus is coming to town The Zero G Circus is coming to town Roll up, roll up, look up, not down There we go, Adam. Oh, so good. It, oh, it just thank gets you. better the more I watch it. Oh, oh really? So uh, there's some. I, I feel there was some slightly off notes in that because it's like, mm, uh, it's just <laughs> as long as you don't mind that. I'm not really a singer, you see. I'm a really? wordsmith, I, not I, a singer. I never, I never would have guessed. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, my sweetheart. Thank you so much, and good luck with the launch. And yeah. all the details have been dropped into the chat. So thank you very much. And what an amazing connection just to meet somebody so obscure and abstract and bring it to the uh, viewers of Pop Astro. So thank you so much. Thank you. I hope everybody has a great day. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Yes, how good was that? Thank you for your lovely comments. Oh, thanks, Liam. I'll write a song about you one of these days if you don't if you're not careful. It's getting hot now. The sun is not real. It's not relenting. Sonia, am I still freezing, my love? I just need some fan. Oh, that's vibrating on my glasses. You won't be able to hear that, but it's making quite a cool note. Right. Okay. Now I know wasn't that just so good. Uh, we're going to play Where's Cosmo. So. Cosmo, as we know, every week jets off somewhere different in the solar system. This is a brain teaser, not a fastest fingers first. So please let me. Oh, I need to play his tune, actually. Um, um, I'm going to read out a couple of clues. When I finish reading them, 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 that is when you answer correctly. OK, so hold your horses for Cosmo's theme, then the clues. Uh, where's his little song gone? There he is. He's in flying around the solar system, or maybe a bit further. But to the casual observer, he's a mithering, pestering sloth. Where have you been to this week, Cosmo? Cosmo, where have you been? Three clues. Only answer after the clues. Cosmo over and out. Do you know, Liam, 
if you go not now wait until the show is finished please we need all the viewers we can get the crusher grape song from cracker jack with Stu francis is absolutely one of the best novelty records of all time it is so funny the lyrics are absolutely hilarious there's so much going on in it with his backing singers I could test drive a Tonka. I could wrestle an action man. Oh, I could rip a tissue. Woo! I could crush a grape. That's excellent. And um, I might take it as musical inspiration for my next song, which is probably going to be about uh, the ISS product that Liam has. There, I said it. Okay, Cracker Jack. Einstein, what was that? Einstein would like that excellent. <laughs> okay, right. Oh, my comments going too quick. Comments going too quick. I'm trying to switch them off and they're just whizzing up in front of me. Okay. Cosmos clues are getting more cryptic as time goes by. So this is a quick one, but it's a good one. Okay. Cosmo, be careful. It could break your arm. Let me take this thing off. They're heavy duty. They are. Wow. How DJs wear them for six hour sets. I don't know. Cosmo, be careful. It could break your arm. That's what you get for pulling out swan's tail feathers. You're a first magnitude idiot. Those clues again. Cosmo, be careful. It could break your arm. That's what you get for pulling out swan's tail feathers. You're a first magnitude idiot. Where's Cosmo been? Who's gonna be first to get it? You're getting a time lag with the audio. Oh, I don't know what to do about that. Do I speak slower or speak faster? Speak into the future. They filmed Cracker Jack. Ooh, let's have a look. A few more people, see if you can get the answer right. Cosmo, be careful. You could break your arm. That's what you get for pulling out a swan's tail feathers. You're a first magnitude little idiot. Okay, Adrian says Cygnus. Um, Sonia says they filmed Cracker Jack in Salford. You can see it. I need to go to the site of the Cracker Jack Studios, please. Okay. Steve says some part of the Swan Nebula. I'm afraid you are wrong, Adrian um, Cygnus. I'm afraid you're kind of right, but wrong. There's a few correct answers flashing up here. Um, I'm going to give you a couple more seconds to see whether you can get it correct. Okay, let's have a look. Who was first to get it right? It was David. I say it's not fastest finger first, but fastest answer on the screen always gets all the glory. Well done, David. Gwyneth, thank you very much. It was Deneb. That is the arse end of Cygnus, Deneb is. It's a first magnitude star. It's the brightest in Cygnus and the 19th brightest in the sky with an average apparent magnitude of plus 125. A blue-white supergiant. Deneb rivals Rigel, Rigel, Rigel. <laughs> it's been so long since I said it. Rigel as the most luminous first magnitude star. So there we go. I am loud and clear from here, Vicky. Oh, no internet. <gasps> <sighs> can my heart finally stop racing about internet issues oh no i'm afraid it can't i'm afraid it can't in two weeks the kids come here and i was speaking to the it technicians here and i've got fast internet now but when the kids come it all gets divvied up between everybody the bandwidth does so i might take a couple of weeks off while the kids are here because i don't want to be doing this on a thursday night when all the kids are here eating all the bandwidth doing their tiktok videos and stuff um so i might have to have permission to have some time off okay well done david right we are now going to go over to eleni here she is are you here eleni three two one hi, hi eleni how are Hi. you? How are you, my human supernova, Eleni? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm really, really good. I'm having a lovely time. It's only one week I've not done this show, and it feels like forever. I've forgotten I how to do everything. It feels so long. I had so many topics because it's been two weeks. I had so many topics to choose from. And at some point, I had like 10 slides up there. I'm like, no, no, no. And I didn't know which ones to remove because everything was so interesting. And I just didn't know what, you know, just keep two good things. But everything else was good too. So uh, yeah. you'll have to I put them it, on the um, Pop Astro website. Oh, yeah, it would be great, actually. I could put everything there, all of the things that I think are interesting and people can have a skim through at their own time. 
that see there you go see i just made a load yeah. of extra work for you that's not extra work you know i just like all the astro related things so it's never extra work oh right uh so uh let's play a little song here it comes uh. Here she is with the space news. It's Eleni, it's Eleni. Prepare to be astonished by Eleni, by Eleni. When she's not reading Tolkien or teaching a class, she's doing yoga and toning up a PowerPoint presentation for astronomer annulation. some cool beats for you there Eleni. it doesn't get old oh it stands it keeps, the test of time it keeps making me laugh which i is saw good. your little face smiling good. yeah it's it's good it keeps making me chuckle which is good excellent excellent that's what i'm all about Eleni. so here's your presentation i'm gonna right. disappear for a few minutes and, and how, long going... do you how long do you reckon your presentation is because i'm gonna go and get a little bit of fresh air it would be something like five six minutes okay good that's long enough that's all i need to go and do a downward dog in the garden perfect well <laughs> okay. i'm struggling to make it big again so uh... Uh, mm, i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> right there we go every time she's got it bang perfect. on okay i'm going see you soon go get some fresh air okay so i chose a couple of things as i said and i tried to make them as not exactly dissimilar but as far from one another as possible so i'm gonna start close with mars and um this particular um uh, topic is quite a, a hot topic in in um, mars um well geology would you call it i guess so um and it's about mars's lakes and there has been quite a bit of discussion lately about whether or not it's got subsurface lakes and there has this is by the way a picture of the the south um pole of mars and that's the icy cap in the south pole and there has been a lot of um radar detections um from under the surface and people do not know what they are so the question of whether or not they're subsurface lakes is not entirely or completely um or actually properly answered yet uh, and the reason for that is that what looks like a reflection from a, a liquid um subsurface volume of something uh, could not be water because it's just too cold for liquid water to exist. Um, so what is it? And the answer is we don't know what it is. So there's quite a few ideas floating around. Um, it could be um, some type sub, some type of um, clay, um, maybe some kind of metal rich mineral um, or even, uh, saline ice uh, or saline liquid sorry so um, these are just ideas but we don't know for sure what they are so it's quite it's quite amazing to think that that's something that's close but yet so far and how hard it is to actually get a proper um, accurate reading of something like that and it always feels so strange to know that we have quite a lot of instruments uh, uh, working on Mars. And we know so much that we didn't know, say, a decade um, ago. And yet we know so little and there's still so much mystery um, surrounding the red planet. And I thought that was really cool. That's why I shared it with you. And now I'm going to take you from Mars, as I said, from very close into our solar system to very far. And I will take us to a new type of supernova and i think because i love supernovae i think that's like incredibly exciting now 
This picture I have here, bear with me, I'll explain why I've got it here. It's, it's the uh, Crab Nebula, which is um, a supernova remnant from the supernova that exploded in 1054. And I'll explain, you'll see in a second why I have it on my screen. Now, there are, up until now, the, the theory is that we have two types uh, of supernova. So we have an iron core collapse supernova, and these occur when you have a star that is um, at least 10 times uh, more massive than the sun. And when you have a star like that, it basically, um, the core collapses under its own gravity into a black hole or a neutron star. And then you can have a thermonuclear supernova, which is basically where you have a star uh, that is up to eight solar masses, and that star um, uh, collapses into a um, neutron star, or oh, sorry, a white dwarf star, and that white dwarf explodes. So these are the two types that we are comfortable with and we know very well so far, and we've seen plenty of uh, data um, to support these two types. However, in the 80s, there was a third type that was predicted, and that was an electron capture supernova. So a different mechanism for the star to collapse. Um, but there wasn't any actual data until 2018. And that's when supernova 2018ZD was observed. And every um, observatory spent time looking at it for a while. So there is a very good set of data and there is spectroscopy done in the um, supernova as well. So everything in the data set indicates that it could um, actually fulfill all of the criteria for an electron capture supernova, um, which is incredible because it, we basically have confirmation of the third type. And this supernova actually shed some light in um, the supernova that exploded in 1054 uh, because it's still uh, quite a mystery and a lot of the data that we have, which again is a well-studied remnant, the Crab Nebula, uh, does not exactly align with the two types, uh, the two uh, currently known types of supernova. But it aligns pretty well with um, this third type, the electron capture supernova. Uh, so there is um, an increased level of confidence now that the uh, supernova 1054 was actually an electron capture supernova, which would mean that the first recorded supernova that, uh, that um, humans saw and uh, wrote about was not the two types that we are comfortable with and we know very well nowadays, but was actually that third type, the electron capture supernova. And I know I have this silly smile on my face, but I just think it's, just, it's so exciting and it's incredible that things we think we know so well and suddenly they keep surprising us with, um, you know, just a, a little bit here, a little bit there, and suddenly it's something else entirely. And I just think that's the beauty of astronomy that is so fluid and subject to change all the time and updates. And just it's just, a, I think, the best science to be involved in. Apologies to every other scientist out there. Your science is cool too. That's not what I'm implying. <laughs> right. Now, I'm going to go to my space news and weather. Uh, there might be an aurora. Uh, there was, uh, I, I mentioned that sunspot AR 2837 a couple of weeks ago, I think, and it actually erupted yesterday. And it, it uh, sent a massive uh, coronal mass ejection into space. However, it's not um, pointing at us. Um, but it still may affect us. So there is a chance, albeit tiny, that there might be an aurora. So just stay tuned if you're into your auroras, there might be one coming up. Mm -hmm. Might not be spectacular, but it might happen. And last but not least, the astronomy picture of the day. Ooh, nice. It's incredible. I was so excited with that. I actually shared it with a year eight class I had today. Um, and they loved it because it's something so, I just feel it's something you can 
relate to if you want it's it's not far away it's your own sun it's it's our own sun and um what we're seeing here is actually uh the sun at its closest point to earth and at its farthest uh from earth so these two are called uh, the perihelion and the aphelion now it's big enough to be able to detect and that's something that's that's always um worth keeping in mind that the earth's it, it's proof that the earth's orbit first and uh, and foremost is an ellipse um it's an, an elliptical orbit and if you needed further proof which we don't but this is proof and the sun sits at one of the focal points of the ellipse and when we get uh, closest to the sun, which happens, um, well, actually, I will not say how often it happens. Let's see if people can give me uh, um, their answers in the comments, see how often we get closest to the sun and how often we get farthest from the sun Ooh. in the days. The dates should be indicative, but just a small brain teaser. Um, so that's when we were closest to the sun, and this is our farthest point from the sun. Also, the fact that these months are about six months apart should give you another clue. Um, and it's just amazing to be able to measure this change in size. Uh, just to clarify, the size of the sun does not change. Maybe I should say the apparent size changes, and that's because of how far and how close we are to it. So the sun doesn't really change, doesn't grow bigger or smaller yet. If it started growing bigger, we should be worrying. Um, and I will <laughs> leave you with that. And I hope you enjoyed that. I really didn't know what to choose today. So if you guys have, um, if you really are interested in, um, you know, everything else I had to share, then just send me a message and I'll put it up on on the website as Vicky suggested so yeah very good me. Eleni thank you so much for your meticulously prepared presentation uh, Ian says closest in December furthest in June and July yeah I think the closest one well it is obviously because of the tag and pull of other planets mostly Jupiter it's not always going to be precisely on the same date all the time but I do think this year, uh, January was the closest approach. I don't think it was December, but yeah, um, obviously it will be closest um, halfway around the orbit at some point of that orbit farthest. Yeah, at the other end, six months later. So yes, December, January, June, July. Well done, Ian, obviously. Ian knows his stuff. He really surprised. does. Um, perfect. And I will leave that here and have a lovely evening and enjoy Sonia's presentation. It should be great as always. Oh, so sweet. Okay, Team Pop Astro, we've got a new Facebook chat group. I'm so proud of you. In fact, Sonia, are you there? One sec, I'm gonna put Sonia on. The three girls. Hello. Hi. 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 Uh, Hello. I just need to say, I know I say this a lot, but I'm so proud of you. Uh, we are the, to my knowledge, the only three girls presenting an astronomy chat Ooh. show. And weather. It only yeah. goes forecaster as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's right. cool. Yeah. Okay. I can't wait till we all meet. It's going to be awesome when we that all will meet. That will be awesome. We, okay. we should try and do some sort of like pop astral live all together somehow. That would be, be nice. Really I'm, I'm up for it. That would be great. Yes. Oh, lovely ladies. Right. I'm going to say goodbye to you both. We've got Steve Tonkin waiting on the other line and I don't keep a binocular astronomer waiting any longer. So see you soon, ladies. Uh, thank Bye. you, Sonia. Bye, Eleni. Bye. 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 Bye, Steve. We're coming to you now. Mr. Tonkin. Hello, Hi. Vicky. <laughs> oh, it's always so good whenever you're on. I know that. it's. Uh, what did they call it? My new favourite phrase, drinking from the fire hose. Indeed. <laughs> I well, know you're yeah. off this stuff, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got musty warm water, but cheers to you anyway, Steve. Yeah. yeah. So how how, how are things, Vicky? 
Oh, well, I'm always very cheerful on a Thursday night. Life is good. We've got new internet. Cosmo the Sloth has been off to Deneb. Um, I've got a brilliant production team here. And life is beautiful. How about you? Absolutely fantastic. Come out of retirement to do a job that I really feel as I'm doing some worthwhile stuff in. So it's brilliant. Oh, just like, give us like, a little like... recap on your dark skies job, please. I forgot you. Well, that's that. what I'm going to be really... talking about. Isn't it? Um, I... Having been retired for best part of five years, I applied for this job. There was Steve, this job's for you. Apply for it. I, I thought, oh, come on, you know, I'm an old man. You know, you don't want old men on this sort of thing. Anyway, I applied for it and I got it. And I'm now the Dark Skies advisor to the first, the only area of outstanding natural beauty that is also an international dark sky reserve. So that's Cranbourne Chase. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's been tricky because of lockdown, can't get out to see people, can't get out to do stuff. But it's, you know, we're, we're working on it. We've got a dark sky accreditation scheme. We're trying to push well astro tourism. So, you know, for spending, you know, more than 60 years doing astronomy, I'm now actually feel as I'm putting stuff into it and sort of feed, you know, sort of making, a, making a difference for the future. So that is, suits me. Very I'm, good, I'm very I'm good. Very good. I'm just looking out the window. We've got a sun dog here, actually, but um, might get some NLCs tonight. It's been so long since I've seen the moon. I've got no idea what phase it's in. No, I haven't seen it for ages. Either. It's been cloudy here. There was, a, there was a monsoon just so I was coming across to the office to to do this. So it's, it's a it's been weird weather this year. Last year was lovely. You know, this time it was warm. It had been dry. Everybody was okay. Oh, lockdown. Hey, that ain't that so bad because we've got this lovely weather. But no, this this year has been a bit different. Oh, but no. I've had my lockdown project. I've built myself a, a remote imaging observatory, which nice. is completely off grid. Um, so lot, big, big learning curves there, especially since the person who did the footings for me actually made them. Well, they're about five millimeters off being a perfect rhombus when they were meant to be square. <laughs> so, it's, you know, so, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's been interesting doing that, you know, make, making everything fit. But hey, you know, this, this is life and it works and it's fantastic. And, <laughs> five millimeters off being a perfect rhombus. When it should have been a square. Yo, hey, well, hey, you know. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. That's funny. So, Steve, what's your presentation on tonight then? I'm um, going to talk about, look, we all need light at night for, 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 you know, for safety, for, you know, just going about our daily business, all the rest of it. But this is really about how, how do we get it right? And that's the, for me, that, that's the really important thing. So do you want me to hit the share? Yeah, that'd be lovely. Thank you, Steve. Let's see if that the old faithful uh, button works. Uh, let's hope I get the right one. And I want that one. There he is. Here we go. Jolly good. Okay. okay. Off you go. So, the right light at night. So here we go. Um at least I hope we do. Well, we, as I said, we we all need it, and we need it for safety. You know, you 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 don't want to walk around the dark. You fall over things. We need it to work because we don't always work just before, just between dawn and dusk. We need it for leisure. You know, we are we are social we are social beings. But when you see something like this, you realise how absolutely blooming awful it is. Because every single photon you can see coming up from there is light that's wasted. It's not, it's not doing any good at all. It's just lighting up things that don't need to be lit up. So we have these costs that are associated with it. And we see this all the time. I mean, we see this, you know, we're all familiar with sky glow, you know, these domes of light. In my case, because I'm lucky on the horizon, but for some people, it's over their heads, you know, sort of. 90% of people in these islands have never, ever seen the Milky Way. And that is just shameful. You know, this is something that has been part of our culture. Um, it's It's been something that all of humanity, ever since we, we evolved as human beings, as Homo sapiens, have shared. And we're just wiping it out. I, I think that I think that's absolutely shameful. This is how I came, I came to it through astronomy. So the sky glow is one thing. This is a lovely place just near me. This is Knowlton Church um, 
on the Cranbourne Chase. And we can see the sky glow from Salisbury above it, but it's lovely. Yeah, it's a lovely place. And then we get glare. You've all had, if you're driving, you've seen this. You know, this is the light that dazzles you. And again, it's it's completely unnecessary. This is a a used car dealership quite near where I live. They've got these socky great bulkhead lights on the walls, and they they're just completely uncontrolled. And you drive down the road, and actually you can't see anything. And the other side of it is what's called light intrusion. Some people call it light trespass. When you know light just goes where it doesn't need to be. Um, and the thing is, UK street lighting counts for, as we've got here, you know, a third of a council's carbon emissions. And, and if we're concerned about climate change, and yes, we should be. If you don't believe me, ask people in British Columbia at the moment. Um, more than 25% of that light just goes upwards. It does absolutely no good at all. And so what we need, really, is we need light just where it is needed. We don't need light going into windows. We don't need light going upwards. You know, it's a, an area we need to be light, and that's just light. And that's the thing. This is um, Badbury Rings, a lovely place on Cranbourne Chase. And we've got the constellation of Orion rising there. You can tell because there's a pink star in the middle. And there aren't such things as a pink star. That's the Orion Nebula. Um, and the, the light behind it is the aurora for Bournemouth and Poole which is basically light pollution. Um, and, you know, this helps. You know, we if we do this, if we light up our sky at night, we'll take the astronomy thing first, we are reducing our ability to um, see things like incoming comic nuclei or something like that. Now, we've, we know we've tracked most of the uh, near-Earth asteroids and all the rest of it, but there's still the possibility of comet nuclei coming in. So if we're concerned about global defense, we need actually to make sure we can see the stuff coming in. This is the Behringer Crater in um, in uh, Arizona. Um, I saw one, so isn't it, isn't it lucky that it just missed the visitor center there? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Oh, obviously, because instead it was built millions, millions of hundreds, thousands of years later. Um, but we've we've seen this sort of thing happening, you know, from this is the Chelyabinsk one a few years ago. Um, Chelyabinsk was, fortunately, nobody was killed. But it was this was something just the size of a house coming in. So we've got these, a uh, whole network of um, telescopes that are looking out for these things. But they are being hampered because of this light we show upwards. And there's other consequences as well. You've got light like this. Well, a farmer I was talking to the other day, he said, he said well, you know there's something wrong. When you go out for milking at 4 o'clock on a winter's morning and you hear the wrens and the sparrows singing, they shouldn't be doing that because it's dark then. Um, and the big deal was in um, New York, they've got this what they call this tribute in light. It's to do with the 9-11 thing. It says light going upwards. And when they turn it up, well, we can see the difference here. When it's off, you get 500 birds within half a kilometer. When they turn it on, within five minutes, you've got nearly 16,000 birds what? within half a kilometer. And they come to it, and they get into this canyon of basically, what well, for them is a canyon of, of buildings. And, you know, they land, they they become predated upon, they become disorientated, and it's oh reckoned that about about ten billion, not ten million, ten billion birds um, die each year purely because of light pollution. Birds, <gasps> most birds migrate at night, and this the light actually prevents them doing it. This is um, the death toll, the death toll from a single building in Toronto in one year. No. This is, yeah. This so this is the sort of thing we're talking about. So oh. I got into this through astronomy, but what has become more and more obvious to me as I've been working with this is the the really big deal is biodiversity. Um and it doesn't just stop with with animals with migrating things. Um I mean, the difference in the trees here, look where the light is. The light in this bottom one here, under the oh, light, what? the leaves are green. And this Rus, which is a lo lovely plant, a lovely thing. It's, so it's it's turning red later. Um, here, next to the light, 
it's dropping its leaves later. And this means trees are becoming stressed and ultimately they're living less long and they're dying. We've got the same thing with, um, we're getting algal blooms, light pollution, reducing algal, algal, algal blooms would become toxic. So this, you know, this goes so far beyond the astronomy. And this is the one that really brings it, and this is the one that really frightens me. Um, we've got here the difference. This is a single image of a, a, a blue rich light on the left and a sort of more warm white, even though it's brighter light on the right. And look at the number of insects around there. Anybody who drives will have noticed within the last 10 years, the number of bugs you get splattered on your windscreen or your number plate is vastly reduced. And we are into, we are into an insect Armageddon. Now, insects are the linchpin of any sort of healthy in, uh, ecology. And what's happening is insects are being attracted to these lovely, cheap um, LED blue-rich lights. And as a result of that, they're being predated upon. They're not foraging. They're not reproducing. You know, they're not feeding. They're, they're, they're doing nothing that they should be doing. And they're and it's becoming an absolute blooming disaster. And there are three things that are in that are implication in this. And the top three things are basically by um, uh, habitat loss, climate change, and artificial light at night. So we've got to do something about artificial light. Now, bats are one thing. Bats, the fast flying ones, like the pipistrels and stuff like that, it's absolute feast time. With, around the lights because that's where the insects are. But the slow ones will actually stay in their roosts and might even starve themselves to death because they, the slower flying ones become predated upon. So they're frightened of that. And there have been cases now of, of when entrances to bat roosts have been lit, they will not come out at all. You've got the thing with sea turtles. Now, what the way when the hatchlings come out, if you live by the sea, what you've got is when there's no moon, the horizon, the sky is slightly brighter than the sea. And this is what these things go for. You put artificial light about and they just wander around the beach or they go into the hotel that's doing it. And I mean, a small fraction of them survive anyway, and we're making it worse. Now, one thing we need to realize is the natural light at night, the sort of stuff we used to, the sort of stuff we grew up with is this sort of this reddish, this what we call this warm white light, so firelight or you know this, the uh, the sunset light there, and and that when it's dim and it's fine, it actually doesn't do a heck of a lot of harm. But you get the blue in, and it absolutely hammers our um, our, our natural rhythms, our, circ our circadian rhythms, uh, which also uh, um, regulates a, a substance called, called melatonin. So you get all these things that are lifted on the left there happening. Uh, it happens through the, the hypothalamus, but they've very, very recently, only um, a few years ago, um, discovered there is another receptor in the retina, which is, is the one that actually moderates this. So if you've got blue rich light around you at night, what it's doing is it's actually affecting you. It is affecting your health. And melatonin suppression is on this orange line here. And the typical bright white LED light has an output something like this. And you see how the peaks are very, very close together. Now, what that means is that ultimately, that bluish white light is clobbering your melatonin. And melatonin um, protects us from a lot of things. Now, people say, oh, well, yeah, but it's only a 4,000K light, 4,000K LED light. You know, it's moonlight, which is reflected sunlight, is actually much behind that. So why aren't we bothered about moonlight? And this is the difference. What we're looking at is what's called correlated color temperature. And we've got this, with LEDs, we've got this amazingly big blue streak here. And that, and that is the one that's harmful. So that's the one we want to watch out for. And there are these consequences. And it's ex almost exactly the same as people who, who work um, irregular shift work and stuff like that. You get this reduced cognition. Don't worry. If this gets worse, Vicky. You get attention loss and memory impairment. Well, I'm getting old. I get that anyway. Immune system suppression. 
depression, bipolar disorder become enhanced by this. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol anomalies, heart disease. And lastly, it's cancer. Breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, endometrial cancer, all because we are subjecting ourselves to this blue rich light at night. And they, um, there's a, a new paper, it's just come out. Um, it's on the Commission for Dark Skies website. Have a look in their publications. It was put on there just this last week where it shows that really this stuff is there. So we said, well, we need it for safety and security. Yeah, okay, fine. Here's safety and security. Do you see the bloke in the background there? Well, you do now when you actually cut the light down, don't you? And you could do this with uh, so many examples of this. People have this silly idea that because some light is good, more light is better. More light is very, you know, that what we're trying to push for, and this is through the Institute of Lighting Professionals and through the International Dark Sky Association and the um, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and just by everybody who knows their stuff about this. And what they're saying is, for heaven's sake, use the lowest amount of night that you need, and don't assume that because the standard says one thing, if you improve it, you're making things safer. And this scar on the road here is, is not far from where I live. This is the remnants of a burnt out car. The standard here is a streetlight standard. This thing, this was done under a streetlight. If you think streetlights prevent crime, well, no, they're not intelligent. Um, so look at this little video here. This is something I, I really love showing you. We've got a pedestrian over here and watch what happens because of the bad lighting. See how your pedestrians almost disappeared there. It's like right. a reverse ghost video. It is, isn't it? You know, you basically, if you see that, it disappears. Light, it, it's called luminance veiling. And so what people think are security lights. Oh, excuse me. Let me go back a bit. I uh, managed to do something silly there. What people think are security lights. I call them insecurity lights. <laughs> Very um, good. Uh, you know, they, they they can be so restrictive, they can damage what they're trying to do. So, again, you know, this guy there, you know, as he, he just disappears. So what we're pushing for is this, that all light has to be useful. You need to think about before you put any light out there at night, do you actually need it? If I haven't got a clear use, don't use it. Um, it needs to be targeted. Only put it where you need it. <clears throat> we don't need to um, look to light up the underbellies of aircraft or bats or migrating birds or anything like that. We only need the amount of light that's necessary. Um, we only need it when it's necessary. There's no point, you know, uh, something I'm having words with uh, local police about at the moment. because they are, Oh, security lighting should be dusk to dawn. No, it shouldn't. If it's what? dusk to dawn, nobody you know everybody sees it's all just on all the time if you have it controlled so it's for example motion sensor um triggered then people notice hey a light's gone on something's happening it's m much more secure and, and use the warmer colors dark sky does not mean dark ground so we see this a lot i mean this is this is tucson arizona tucson on the right here the ground is perfectly lit. You can see the Milky Way from downtown Tucson. This is a city of nearly half a million people. Nice. You can see here the effect of a partial on a, on, a, on a light here. This is without it. This is with it. Where do you see more? You see more when your light is shielded, where the light is direct to where it is. This is a nice little before and after. So they had 80 watt bright white lights on beforehand. They were replace them with 32 watts, so it's less than half the output of warm white lights. And where, what do you see more on? Less light can mean better visibility. And if you have a motion detector for convenience, security and that, well, then, you know, you it's, it's so, so much better for everybody. And if we look at this one here, 
this is just different light colors. If you were driving on the road and somebody was coming along at you with their headlights on with a particular color, which color would you prefer coming at you? This <laughs> high intensity blue or this relatively warm white? And it doesn't have to mean going back to the old um, sodium lights, you know, which gave us very poor color rendition and that. Because modern LED lights, even though they look like they're the same color, as you can see he here, they actually give us very, very good color rendition. Um, so we, we don't need to do that. And this is the sort of thing that we should be doing because this is the thing that is less harmful for us. It's less harmful for the environment. And really, it's less harmful for, for biodiversity. Um, and if we do this, then we can... There's, there's benefits to this. So where we are on the Cranbourne Chase, we're now pushing for astro-tourism. Um, so holiday places can extend their season from just the summer right into the autumn and winter because it attracts more visitors. And this is, where do you get, um, where, where, where do you get a return on investment like this? Galloway Forest, when it became a, a dark sky reserve, um, every pound invested gave you a return of £1.93. I mean, yeah, come on, this is good. And the over and they reckon the overall benefits are much are much more. Ah, uh, uh, just just finish with this. This is Michael Crichton, who you, you might have heard of. He wrote Jurassic Park. He wrote Jurassic Park. Great, but book. there is this. This is the thing that we have all shared, and when once we lose it, okay, this is a philo philosophical thing. There's no proof on this. This is the thing that has sort of kept us in touch with the rest of humanity and we are wiping it out. Now, mm. whether or not people care about that, I don't mind. But the thing really please look at is the effect on, if you care about yourself, human health, but really if you care about the planet, it's the biodiversity. The biodiversity impacts of artificial light at night, but particularly with the LEDs, is absolutely horrendous, and we really all ought to be worried about it. Some people reckon the effect on the insect population is probably worse than climate change. So, But the thing is, we know we can do something about it, and it just comes down to having the right, chi the right amount of the right sort of light in the right place at the right time. And that's all we need to do. Everybody wins, apart from the people who sell energy and people who sell crappy lighting. And with that, I'll shut up and <laughs> stop going on about wow. this. Wow, <laughs> wow, Steve! They they definitely chose the right person in you to to spread that potent, powerful message. Well done. I feel like going and putting a streetlight out right now with my bare hands. Don't be, but that's criminal damage. You see, right. you don't do that. We we. Now, we've got an all-party parliamentary group on light pollution now, which has been um, yes. for about the last five months. So that's sort of happening. It's it's beginning to get through, but we really need people. People, if you're listening to this, please write to your MPs. Tell them to join the APPG. You know, sort of take care of this. And astronomical societies, um, I, I have to say, have been very, very lax on really really pushing this thing um we are the people who notice it um who who notice light pollution because we're out there a lot at night and you know i have a situation where the garage across the road from me put up a floodlight on his on his courtyard and it was shining right between my shed and my house right to where i set up my telescope oh no and i thought oh my god so i went over i don't know whether david you know this is and he was appalled and within 10 minutes, he had a ladder up and that light was facing downwards where it Lovely. needed to be because he hadn't rec he hadn't realized it. Um, other neighbors put up insecurity lights. And I went and said, were with them and said, look, this is just showing right. My God, doesn't he? And they were appalled as well. They hadn't realized it. Most people are reasonable. And if you talk to them about what they're doing, they, will say, they, they just don't know. And our job as you know, astronomers as anybody is is really, really, really to try to educate people. We see it. We know what's going on. Let's try and help people do the right thing because ninety nine percent of people just really don't know. Um, and 
you know, you get things like I'm having a battle with an outfit called SVP Lighting who keep advertising on Facebook. And these re horrible lights, 4,000 Kelvin, which is ridiculous. Um, you know, sort of really bright white, some of it going upwards. And they, and the, you know, and, but, you know, people think, oh, great, it's bright. Because we all think, until we know better, that bright light and more light is better than less light. And it really isn't. Sorry, I, Vicky, I could bore for England forever okay. on this. I think I should well, probably well, shut up and give somebody else a chance. Okay, well, uh, Paul Sutherland has re-emerged from I don't know where because he's not been making his usual Paul Sutherland's pithy comments. Um, so councils need to recognise the importance of light pollution. Here we used to have street lights go out at 1am, but pressure from the few who are scared of the dark streets got them to... Uh, bad luck. Yeah, it's a shame, Paul. You know, people really ought to... Um, I, I think humanity needs to in, in, invent the torch. <laughs> so we can Frankie. go out the... Steve then... um, uh, so I'm going to go over to Sonia in a minute it has been a delight having you on as always maybe next time when you come on we'll do some proper binocular astronomy maybe in a few weeks yeah we can do that I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm up for that particularly getting towards that sort of time of year where I can get out again and I've got Yay. actually I've got some fantastic new binoculars to review for for uh, sky at night so watch out for that one they're going to be coming up there's uh i i can't say any more because i shouldn't but hey um okay part. steve are you ready for your kiss from cosmo oh yeah mwah, mwah. Mwah. oh you've both got the same hair mwah. around your chops <laughs> <laughs> vicky you're such a charmer oh. i am yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to me to flatter the gentleman and the sloths. I'll see you later, Steve. Okay. Uh, yeah, see you, bye. Vicky. Bye. 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 What an amazing presentation. Um, do not shatter street lights, but do write to your MP. Um, yes, let's have a look at that. Jed, brilliant presentation. Needs to be supported. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to go over to Sonia, who's been sat waiting patiently. In my head, this show is one hour long, and it's not even approaching one hour long anymore. It's well surpassed that. But that's because I've got Sonia and Eleni and amazing guests nowadays, and Cosmo as well, barging in on the act. Here we go, Sonia. Sonia. Hello. Hi. Ah, how was your hot tub party a few weeks ago? We've not had you for two weeks now, have we? Oh, I know. Oh, it was amazing. I'm actually amazed. I only put one pound on the scales as well. It's slimming well. <laughs> and I had another party last week as well at my friends in Chesterfield, and I had a pile height of food. So, yes, I am now doing so much exercise, so much running for those scales again on Monday evening at weigh in. Oh. And it was on Sunday, and I said to Peter, we'll get pizza and we'll have day balls and chips with it as well. So, I may not be going to Slimming World after all. Oh, wow, Sonia. Oh, gosh, it's like a constant battle, isn't it? It's like a just a constant seesaw act, isn't it? <laughs> so, what's your presentation on tonight, Sonia? So, it's that time of season. It gets muggy it gets hot we can't sleep it gets humid and we have the extreme weather of what we have known as thunderstorms here in the uk it's probably the only extreme weather we do have here we do have the odd tornado as well um we also get thunder snow as well in winter i've only managed to see it twice in my lifetime but i shall go more on that um actually in winter itself okay so we shall start with thunderstorms so as, as, as I said before, the most extreme weather are thunderstorms in the UK. We get torrential rain, we get hail, we get thunder, we get lightning, and we get the odd tornado, as we've seen in the past month down south. I don't know if anyone has seen that Facebook with all the bin swirling and oh, everything in the air. I was like, oh, my gosh, I was there to witness that. That would be amazing to see, but probably not the most exciting sight for the residents who have seen all that significant significant damage especially in those small communities where it will cost a lot of damage repair work as well so for any thunderstorm especially in the summertime it's that heated air because of the ground surface is hot and they do have those high temperatures much higher than the surrounding air itself especially in the period of summer when we get the hot weather and so the warmer um, surface heats the cell which rises up um, towards the troposphere creating the turbulence so remember the troposphere that's the highest atmosphere 
um, in the sky, up in the clouds, where we see those noctilucent clouds. So that's where it all goes on. Um, so a large rising cell or bubble of air is formed, and so the water vapour cools and it condenses, forming ice crystals and water droplets. So both the clouds, they all become electrically charged. They have both negative and positive charges in these clouds. So as the air rises, it cool air descends, only to be heated again. So when you get the hot air rising, it moves along and it then cools down. And when we have those long, prolonged storms, it's because the hot air keeps going up, the cool air keeps going down and so we just get that surrounding air and then it will soon disperse when you look at a cauliflower cloud because i can never say the cumulonimbus cloud yes <laughs> when when you see them really tall um you'll usually notice they might be flat that is what's called a cap so when that cap has gone that means we are most likely then to get that storm so notice so when you look at these obvious clouds look at the caps on them are they cauliflower looking? Are they bubbly or are they flat? So when they're flat, that means the cap has gone and they're positive and negative charge now. And we are most likely to see that thunderstorm. Okay. Um, and these anvil headed clouds, they can be up to six miles wide and 12 miles high. They are actually humongous clouds for thunderstorm. Um, so in the summer, you might have these lovely cumulus clouds. And then when the ground gets heated, it rises up and then it rises up for the cumulus clouds. The cumulus clouds grow, 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 grow into these humongous cumulonimbus clouds. And that's when we get that thunderstorm. I'm getting yes. better with this. So we go on to the next storm, please, Vicky. Yeah, got you. So lightning, so lightning, as we know, is the most common feature of a thunderstorm. There is no agreement yet of how lightning is formed. It's believed to be between ice crystals that are negative and positively charged. And they come extremely electrified and so chargical, charged particles separate. So the positive charged particles, they develop at the top of the cloud, whilst the base of the cloud is negatively charged. And so the ground beneath develops a positive shadow. So when we get a um, cloud to ground lightning stroke, um, the um, positive charge from the cloud goes down and negative charge from, oh, no, I have got that the wrong way around. I do apologise. So the cloud is negative, negatively charged. So the negative charge comes down and then the positive charge from the um bottom then goes and they meet in the middle and that's where we get the leader of a lightning strike so the air around the channel it is around thirty thousand degrees celsius and the electrical discharge can be at least 1.5 million volts which is mostly converted into heat energy now i absolutely love this did you know point the lightning bolt of lightning is actually hotter than the surface of the sun it only lasts a typical 0.2 seconds, but um, when, you, when you see a tree, it has all the roots and it's the water, when, when it rains or the soil is moisture, the water feeds up in the tree and the roots. The lightning is hot enough to actually heat the water inside the tree, causing the tree to actually explode. Always very I impressive when you see that on YouTube. Fascinating. Mm. That is absolutely fascinating. Oh, sorry. I've just opened a 0% beer. Have you seen this stuff? It sponsors all the football and all the F1. And now it sponsors Heineken Zero. Now sponsors Pop Astro Live. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so we will go on to what actually causes thunder and lightning. There we go. So when the heat expands very rapidly, it creates a sound wave. And that sound wave is what we hear as the thunder. And because the speed of sound is much less than the speed of light, there are several seconds delay between the flash of lightning and the sound of thunder. And as we know, lightning tends to hit tall objects such as trees, skyscrapers, skyscrapers, lightning conductors, and even people, especially if you're beneath those trees, you mm. are at risk of a severe lightning strike. Golf is particularly where they're still golfing whatever they use. Um, sticks, Rackets. whatever they are. They actually have professional detailed forecasts. 
So they have people in the background doing all this iggly jiggly stuff that I do on the computer. And if they can see a storm is approaching, if they know it's going to be stormy, they will. They won't do the golfing that day because it's putting those golfers at risk. Wow. Um, in a typical thunderstorm in the UK, there can be at least, if we get a really, really good storm, at least a thousand strikes that can take place per hour. But particular thunderstorms, especially in Quebec City, they can have up to 3,000 lightning strikes an hour. And don't always think lightning doesn't strike in the same place because it actually does. A lot of people don't believe that when you're like, nah, it, it can't strike the same place. It does strike that same place twice and make sure you're not in that place it has just struck because it can do it again and you will be at risk of it because the energy it's the, the play the part that it has struck it is still got that positive charge in it so it can still strike it again and the heat intense heat from the flash of lightning causes the air to expand and then contract and that's where we get that sound of thunder wow yes so we will go on to the different types of lightning strikes. So I've done the two main lightning strikes. There are six different types, but I thought I'd narrow it down to the ones that we most know. So we have the cloud to ground, the fault lightning, which is ground to gr cloud to ground lightning. And it's, it's like branches, it's like a branches on the trees. So the heat lightning, it's a lightning flash that appears to produce no thunder because it occurs too far away for the actual thunder to be heard. And so the sound waves dissipate before they reach the observer, which is when it hits the ground. And then we have the sheet lightning, where we can't actually see the strike. Um, it just lights up the sky itself, which is known as the luminosity during the flash. And so the lightning itself can't be seen by the spectator, so it happens as a flash or sheet of light. We oh. also have... Another sort of lightning, uh, which I didn't include, is, is called a sprite. Oh, I like them. Um, There's a guy who photographs those in uh, North America, and he's taken uh, loads of pictures of them. Yes, so the, the sprites are known as red sprites because they appear red, which they, they appear in the top of the troposphere. So we don't see them below the clouds here. They appear above the clouds as if they're going in towards space. And so they occur a height above the thunderstorm cloud itself. Oh, and great. they have visual shapes flickering in that sky. They're usually triggered by discharges of positive lightning between an underlying thundercloud and the ground itself. Um, if you Google YouTube, if you Google on YouTube and have a look at ISS and sprites, there are some cool videos on there of how they see sprites. Wow, from, cool. From there as well. Um, which leads me on to the last bit of the presentation of do's and don'ts of safety lightning. Well, that's a lot it's, of things to do there. It is. So if you are near trees, make sure you're crouching down. So you're not the highest object. You're not going to be in that positive charge of the lightning strike. Don't go near concrete or floors or walls. Really? Because, yes, because it travels through. Oh, well done, there honestly. You go. So let's just have the top couple there, Sonia. What's the so, couple of ones. takeaways? So I'll, I'll do the don'ts. So the, the main don'ts don't go under trees. The ones that I tell people and they don't believe me is don't have a shower because if that lightning strike hits some sort of water feature anywhere, it will actually, the, the electrical charge will actually travel down and it can get you in the shower. Oh, imagine you're just soaping your bits. <laughs> you will have a bit of fried bits there. <laughs> and, um, shower bacon. Shower bacon. Try not to use your landline as well because the same thing can happen. Landline? If... What's a landline? <laughs> my mum still uses a landline. <laughs> Actually, I spoke to, I wonder if my friend, my new space tourism friend, Melinda, is watching this. Melinda Lyons, if you've made it through, hello. I did speak to Mel Melinda on her landline today. So I'm sorry, landlines. Come back, all is forgiven. Because <laughs> the same thing can happen as well if, lightning strikes anywhere near the house it hits mm. some sort of connection it can do your damage to your phone the one thing that really irritates peter is i do have a habit of taking out the aerial of the tv because if the lightning wants to strike yeah. your aerial your tv has gone kaput it's gone boom it will set on fire wow i'd like to see that right sonia i it's am I'm getting a really sore back sat on this stool. 
So I wouldn't normally hurry along, but I'm sat on a new stool. It's killing me. So I think we're going to move along to your weather now. Is that all right? Weather, yes. So tonight's forecast, it's not Ooh. looking too bad. Hang on a minute. One sec. One sec. Let me remove that. I'm going to play your song, though. You still got okay. your song. Yeah. I don't mean to be rude, Sonia, but it's getting to that time now for me now. So let's have a look. Banners. Brand. brand. Here comes Sonia's song. Here it is. Where did it go? Uh, oh, Sonia's weather jingle. There you go. Will it be cloudy? Will it be sunshine? Will there be hurricanes? Sonia's been checking out the jet stream and the humidity. Is it safe to get my telescope out or will it blow over and bend? Well, Sonia's here with all the answers, my starry-eyed astronomer friend. Ah, are we going to get some good weather, Sonia? Well, it's, it's going to be 50-50, so if you are wanting to get out there tonight um, after Pop Astral Life, it's not looking too bad. Um, it's going to be mostly partly cloudy, but you may get some gaps. Ireland's going to be really cloudy tonight and northern Scotland, but it might not be too bad out there. However, if we go and go through to Friday, it's going to be a mixture of sunshine and showers, so at your own risk, take out your telescope, but be prepared, there could be a hefty shower in there, like it has been. However, Saturday is looking very promising. Saturday is the best day of the weekend so far. Ooh. It is looking like it is going to be extremely clear at the moment, apart from Ireland. Well, forget Ireland, that's got no chance. Sorry, Sorry Ireland. But, yeah, we're not looking too bad. Northern Scotland may just get a fringe of some rain and drizzle and clouds, but we are looking good to go, guys, on Saturday. Yeah. We zoom along to Sunday, and it's all going downhill again. I'm afraid oh. we've got the cloud, and we've got the rain coming in. I thought there was a heat wave. No. Well, two no. people have told me there's a heat wave coming today. No. No what? heat wave. No heat no wave. No heat wave. Two no, people have told won't. me that there's it right. Heat wave. I'm just going to Google heat wave. Okay. I was excited for that. Heat wave UK 2021. No, Met. the, the night temperatures were looking at 12, 13 degrees at least. So I can't see it being too much of a heat wave if that's going to be nighttime temperatures at uh, the moment. It says, okay. So a July heat wave is still on the cards for all that. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. You're right. It, it's going to be. That they're not sticking the neck out. It's going to be a rain and a heat wave, apparently. Yeah. Monday is looking like a washout. So forget Monday. That's going into Tuesday morning. Although Scotland, yeah. Scotland's not looking too bad. It's going to be mostly England, uh, Wales that are going to get the rain on Monday night. Tuesday is going to be split. So southwest is looking rainy. And then when you go a bit further north, it's going to be cloudy. But when you get southwest Wales, Scotland, it's going to looking like it's going to be clear Tuesday night. And then we'll go as far as Wednesday. And it's Wednesday's not looking too bad at the moment. It is looking clear apart from northern Scotland and Ireland, which will we'll get rain. So it's a bit of a 50-50 bit of a mashup at the moment, even though the jet stream is sort of like over us and going uh, under us yeah. so yes it is okay. a bit 50 50 at the moment out there i'm afraid i'm just going to read this great comment here i was on anglesey in 1975 when lightning struck a house in frostnega that is where danny um robertson lives the other um dark sky advisor uh steve's colleague it melted the polystyrene tiles on a bedroom ceiling which dripped onto the couple into the bed below sounds like something out of a bad sitcom doesn't it <laughs> i was in a metal frame tent watching the night turn today with each lightning flash vivid memories there david um you should be a writer good good vivid memory there <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for coming on tonight, Sonia. We have missed you. Um, and um, I'm going to end the broadcast now. Uh, did you see the Zero-G juggler? A Cosmo might get a ride on a parabolic flight. How oh, funny is that? That was just I did the second video. I was like, when he wasn't moving and he was moving, I was like, that just doesn't make sense. Oh, that wow. Like so really, really confusing. Cool. Ah, this is hurting now. Okay, Jim, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who has liked, tagged, shared the video. Thank you to everybody who's viewed it. Thank you to all of our regulars. Uh, I love you all so much. Uh, thank you to Eleni. Um, oh, it's like I'm winning an Oscar. Thank you to everybody who helped me. Tonight's show couldn't have been what it was without you. 
So thank you, everybody. Um, and um, we'll be along next week. I've got no guests lined up for next week. So if you can suggest any, please do. Mm -mm. Mm. Okay, Sonia, shall we go? Stay on the line and we'll chat about your new job. Yay. I'm going to go backstage now, everybody. Okay, I'm going to give you all 10 seconds to make your final comments. Say whatever you want. And um, I'll flash the comments up on screen. Uh, and in the meanwhile, Cosmo will give me a little kiss. He'll give Sonia a little kiss. Mwah. Oh, do you know who's going to give a kiss? He's going to give a kiss to Paul Sutherland. Mwah. There you go. Because Paul's lovely. Um, we've not heard from him for a while. So there you go. That's for you, Paul. <laughs> Yay. Steve's had his kiss. Uh, Cosmo's got his side sideburns a bit like Steve's. Thank you, everybody. Another great show. My internet. Sonia, you got me so worried about my internet before. I think it was Facebook because I think Paul um, commented about YouTube being fine, but Facebook was a bit oh, freezy God. and I was on the Facebook. Oh, my heart. I could have cried, honestly. The amount they've sent us a 200 quid bit of kit. We've had a 600 quid internet upgrade in total here. And if it was going to be glitchy, that's just an awful thought. Okay. Oh, Sean, you can, you were a new viewer a couple of weeks ago. Welcome back. Oh, thank you, Liam. There you go. Great guess. Right. Good, good, uh, good, 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 good. So much good. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.